All right, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, I'm Katie Full. I am the curator of modern and contemporary art here at NOMA and I had the great privilege of working with Dawn over the course of the last four years to organize her retrospective, which I hope some of you have seen. Dawn, as I'm sure many of you know, I'm looking around and seeing lots of friends and familiar faces, is one of Louisiana's most vanguard artists when it comes to grappling with issues of the Anthropocene with climate change, thinking about social, cultural, and political divisions, and ultimately this increasing gulf or divide between humans and the earth itself. Um, over the course of planning this exhibition in the last four years, we've spent the vast majority of this process basically feeling like the world was falling apart, facing first COVID um, and then Ida um, on the anniversary of Katrina and really seeing you know, so much of the work that Dawn has done since the 70s increasingly begin to reflect upon the reality that we're all living through. And I think it's, it's been so important and rewarding to see so many people respond to this exhibition. And I think really to offer the exhibition is really a space for people to be and to work through um, many of the issues and questions that we're all facing. This exhibition surveys 50 years of Dawn's incredible career from the 1970s till now, recreates uh, vast bodies of work that were destroyed in the artist's studio during Hurricane Katrina, and hopefully really gives everyone a chance to appreciate the full breadth and scope of Dawn's work since the 70s for the first time. We are publishing a exhibition catalog with the publisher Hajikans to be distributed internationally, so please stay tuned for that. Um, and you know, before I turn it over to Dawn, I just wanna say a huge thank you to her. It has been quite the ride. Um, <laughs> For those of you who have not seen the exhibition, um, spoiler alert, if the world is in fact ending and it increasingly as you walk through the show seems like it may very well be, um, <laughs> I think Dawn is the artist we want to ride with together. So thank you, Dawn, for everything. Um, in addition to throwing the best parties in town. Um, Dawn has exhibited her work all across the world um, at the Whitney of Museum of American Art, at the Hammer Museum, the Aldridge Museum of Contemporary Art, the Trans Art Foundation for Art and Anthropology, and at Mass Mocha and now at NOMA. Um, she's a 2013 Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Artist in Residence and 2015 Artist in Residence at the Tulane University Center for Biomedical Research. So I think we're all in for a treat tonight, um, hearing about some of Dawn's interests and preoccupations and great ideas. So I've turned the floor over to Dawn. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here, my goodness. Uh, between time is how I thought I would organize this talk and then, of course, ran out of time. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, we're going to go forward. Um, I am, as Katie uh, shared, of course, very concerned with where we are, where our future takes us. I think we are at such a moment in time um, that we have a few last opportunities to maybe change the course. But if we can't change the course, of course, I've been thinking about transport elsewhere and uh, thinking about metaphoric motherships, spaceships, and I hope you'll all join me. I promise it will have a good cocktail bar. I wanted to dedicate this lecture to my first art colleague, Martin Green, who I grew up with down Esplanade Way and uh, first studied art with under Laura Adams, who came in from New York, wanting to live next to the Degas house. And uh, Martin and I helped usher her into a room, and that began several years of art lessons. Martin is the first artist I know to paint outer space, and uh, I fell into that with him. I also dedicate this lecture to some great pals who took flight this year. Um, the sad thing about this year is we have been unable to mourn and to gather. So anyway, here's a hats off to Diego Cortez, Bill Fagley, to Ellen Johnson, and to Jean Chimino. And I know I have another friend up there, Keith Sonier, how dare I forget. 
Um, anyway, here's to all of the loss this year, and hopefully next year we can do them proud. All right. So uh, 13.8 billion years ago, uh, the show began, and it began, of course, with the Big Bang, we're told. And uh, about 4.5 billion years ago, our solar system took form, an infant solar system, comparatively. And then about 4.2 billion years ago, we have the oldest rock that we've been able to discover in Canada, and the newest big rock is in the Great Hall in the niche. Then about two million years ago, we start walking around or crawling. And this is maybe uh, belongs somewhere else in the show, but I want to talk about the Alpha Omega, how the end of time rejoins the beginning of time. And uh, that big meta, that uh, paradox, is it not a paradox that uh, the yin yang, the Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end. And uh, that doesn't give me much comfort all the time, but uh, it's there and it's wise and it's true. And uh, in that Alpha Omega cycle, it's interesting that we are born of, we are made chemically, uh, our materiality, we're born of stardust, right? And in the end, we decompose and we return to the stars. It gives us a kind of a unity with what's up there, even though it's a bit daunting sometimes. If you're in the Great Hall, you'll hear the voice of Ann Sullivan, who's a friend of mine, and a, you've got one of the most soulful voices. And uh, we selected some poems, uh, part of the Souvenirs of Earth project. And we're not just taking visuals, we respect and love and treasure the spoken word. So these are some of the poems that you'll hear out there. I've titled the whole series, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Nothing gold can stay. Nature's first green is gold. Her heart is hue to hold. Her early leaves of flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day. Nothing gold can stay. Just looking at a few moments in time and thinking about what we've just been through the last two years. This is Mardi Gras in 1930. <laughs> All right. In the Great Hall, we have a centerpiece and something to remind us of how uh, fragile this all is. It's an asteroid come home. In truth, we know that it's probably 200 years before an asteroid will give us a little bit of trouble. But um, it is um, something that uh, landed 66 million years ago, another asteroid in the Gulf of Mexico towards the Yucatan, and it prompted 75, maybe 75, 76, my stat might be off, let's say over 75% of living forms, animal and plant, including dinosaurs. We weren't around yet, we would have been gone too. This asteroid has an anamorphic kind of shape and it is reiterating the forms of the surrounding figurative works, uh, a series from the Vanquish series. And it's the final phase of my long <laughs> going space clown series. These clowns, though, aren't so funny. They're breaking up, uh, kind of whether they're in armor or not, both the metal of their shields and their bones, it's all turning back to chips of meteor. Uh, here's a few of the Vanquish series. And this uh, is one that's not on exhibit, but it's a, a kind of a, a grouping of them that Katie Fole included in her show, Ear to the Ground, which was a beautiful show here that ran for a couple of years with a lot of amazing national and local artists. It's one of the best pictures of me. The picture is a photograph of me in the early 80s standing uh, in Egypt 
I had been walking around Luxor, in particular Valley of the Kings, and I realized with every step I took, I started looking at my feet, and I realized it wasn't dirt as we know it to grow our plants. It was shards of culture. I was just shocked. A bit of a piece of pottery, a bit of a statue that fell off. Um, it was just a profound kind of gestalt shakeup. And I realized that the earth, we are the dust of the earth, not just our loved ones, but, but the bones of culture itself and how special this earth really is um, when we all reduce and join it and we're floating around out there in space. But this is such a, a holy globe, is it not? Everything that we've worked for and loved is here, so we need to take care of it. I'm gonna go now and just talk about the show somewhat in a chronological way as if we're walking through it. In the beginning, Katie has put this CB radio booth, and I think that was a very good call right at the beginning. It's a project from the mid-70s. Uh, it was at the height of CB popularity. Growing up where I did and where I went to school, I realized I crossed divided neighborhoods. We were still struggling, uh, as we are today, with social justice, civil rights. So the CB project was a way to break down some barriers. I think that if you get to know someone, you get to like them, or it, it, it really does help break it down. And you don't, with the CB radio, you don't know the color of the person you're speaking to, you don't know what's in their wallet, you don't know where they're from. And I thought it was just, um, a great thing. It's kind of predates, of course, social media, and we're all doing that today. But um, the project has a few warts, certainly, but I'm very proud of the project because it worked, and we had so many people participating. And in the exhibition, you'll see photographs of people throughout the three parish area. Then when you enter the exhibition further, there's a video piece called The Drummer Boy. Did this in the early 90s, concurrent with working uh, also in prison art programming and working a lot in social justice issues. And particularly in working in the prison, I realized that all the young people I was working with, what they really wanted, it wasn't a pair of shoes. They wanted self-esteem, they wanted respect, and they wanted their glory. And it made me think of all the warriors throughout all the ages and kind of the burden we've put on, on, on the male sometime to join the, join the fight on some level. So the drummer boy, as we know through history, kind of would entice the troops, right? Get them ready for battle, cross the line. So when you see the drummer boy, it's the best drummer of the year from the St. Og marching band, and he's phenomenal. But you're seeing the drummer, just the drum, his face reflected in the drum, but there is a barrier in front, kind of a yellow line to cross, and it's pulling you into the exhibition and somewhat making you complicit in all of this and uh, a partner in it. Um, you remember in historical paintings, right, all of the drummer boy images, it's pretty moving and, and kind of sad that <laughs> they went down at the front line too. In that same space, there's a series of doors, life-size portrait of doors from New Orleans in 1988-89 and one from 1991. There are six doors life-size in the exhibition from a larger series. And they're covered with decorative security bars. Again, I was working on that at the same time, working with a 6,000 inmate population at Orleans Parish Prison. I was dealing with the revolving door, the fear, in the city, the exploitation by 
David Duke, who was running for office at the time, um, kind of uh, campaigning on the notion that violence is a predisposition of race, which we know is like a horrid, horrid thing. So I did these doors to say, look, we're all in this together. You're putting people behind bars, but in your own homes, you're putting yourself behind bars. So uh, let's not point fingers. Let's uh, try to break these barriers down. We didn't put so much work from that time period because our focus really is on the ecology right now and social justice pertaining to that uh, because we should all, regardless of our race, gender, class, we should all have an opportunity uh, to live in the next world, right? To, to go beyond where we are now. So I very much respect identity uh, political art, but I thought my best purpose as an artist right now was to go out further in the environment. When you move further into the exhibition, there's a piece from the early 90s. It's a work called Almost Touching You. It's a video work. It's two figures, a man totally wrapped in plastic, and he's trying to dance with a female nude, very beautiful woman, Botticelli-esque. They're dancing to Chet Baker's uh, song, Almost Blue, and the man can't quite touch the woman. There's this barrier. Almost blue Almost dancing we used to be of course, then it was inspired by AIDS, but we're in a new epidemic, are we not? And intimacy is again challenged. So um, anyway, I'm glad that piece is in the show because it, I think, did work over the decades. You know, we're still dealing with that. Going beyond that, there's a piece called The Face of God in Search Of. Now this was up until now, indeed my most ambitious video work. It was synchronized, five walls and a bed, all computer driven, uh, produced 95 and 96, premiered for the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. I was influenced or impacted by Tennessee Williams' play suddenly last summer. Now, in that play, the protagonist, Sebastian, is a man of means, privilege, and he travels ex around the world, takes a big trip every year, and he goes out in search of God. And if he finds the face of God, only then can he write his great poem. So he finally claims to have found God while standing on it in Cantata's beach as the, all the, the sea turtle eggs are there hatching and the sea turtles, the baby turtles are running to the surf and the, um, it's a slaughter, of course, it's a feeding frenzy, iguana and the birds and so we go through that and then of course I take some artistic liberty and I put in mankind, humankind, man and woman, um, <laughs> into the mix as the greatest predator of turtle, which is true. Um, their turtles are near extinction because we have uh, hunted them or, or for shells, for meat, etc. So we are the culprit. So I added that into the mix. And um, I also give the, the piece a little turn. I remember when I first saw Face of, uh, Suddenly last summer on television, it was a mo the movie version with Cliff Montgomery and Liz Taylor. That's the big white bathing suit scene, you know. Um, anyway, while watching that, um, I had just lost a, a, a sister, a younger sister, and kind of watched her consumed um, by a, a cancer. And so I'm listening to this dialogue, and I said, my God, if you're going to find God in consumption, you don't have to leave your bed. So, because we're born to die, right? Uh, 
and some sooner than others, but we, we ourselves are consumed by nature. So I took issue with this Sebastian, and I still do, and I certainly don't want a God that I find to be locked into consumption. I think consumption is the strangest thing, the fact that we're here, we're all trying to be more and more enlightened, sensitive stewards of the earth, but it's weird that all things consume to live. I hate that. I hate it. So, taking liberty again with our great master, uh, Tennessee Williams, I did my own twist at the end, and instead of God being some kind of bloody beach, I said, well, I'm going to turn to art. I think that's our higher nature. And as much as I love being a practicing visual artist, I so respect music. Having watched my own installations kind of clairvoyantly as a stranger sometime, watching people react, I know how powerful music is. It is the international language. It goes right to the heart. So I chose for my face of God the cello. And the strings of the cello line up with the bed. And um, that's how I close it out. I thought it was ironic, right? I opened the piece that it's open to the supplant, to the beauty of nature, the, the surf coming in. It's, it's kind of benevolent. But at the end, if we're struggling for our lives, we end up often in a hospital, and we st in a sterilized room where we shut nature out, and we're in this kind of cold box. I think it's more in vogue now. A lot of people just want to go home. Thank you very much. But there is that that precedes the final cello. And the last thing I'll say, it's an original score for the work. Uh, his name's on the wall label. <laughs> it was... I'm forgetting it at the moment, but he was the lead cellist for the Miami Symphony Orchestra who I just met in a coffee shop and talked into this. So I think it's a beautiful piece of music. There are, are Facing the Face of God, some other works I did in the, in the mid-90s. Starting to get concerned there about the environment. It's a series called Postcards to Teddy Roosevelt While Thinking of Eves Klein. There are... Uh, landscapes out in the West particularly that didn't quite have the good fortune to fall under Teddy Roosevelt's National Park Plan, thus the postcards to Teddy. And Eves Klein comes in because, you know, I'm a bit audacious, so I stretched out my hands like this to take flight over these distressed landscapes mimicking or paying homage to Yves Klein, his leap from uh, a window into the streets of Paris. So um, that's the reference there, but I uh, also pass by uh, the, there's a piece from the vast array, the, the sound satellite pieces, and there were cows kind of grazing in front of this, <laughs> these huge, huge satellites. Uh, there's also a video piece of sheep grazing in front of the main, main power line that feeds part of the West. And then I came upon, I stopped in my car, get out to film some clouds. And there was a smell, there were flies, and I turned around and it was kind of, you know how we have the, tr romanticism has its tragic moments, right? The horse in the bed or, you know, there's a, there's a bit of darkness to romanticism in landscape, too. And so anyway, there was this um, gorgeously uh, composed deer that had been hit by a car. And, I, and it was off the side of an interstate, and the cars are coming back, passing it. And um, I thought it was, for me, a quintessential American landscape in the 1990s, kind of coming out of the Hudson School and the painter, uh, you know, very much American um, landscape painters. So there's a, a video of that and the, the still works of that aren't in the show. Uh, can't put it all in, there's plenty there. But uh, then moving further down that corridor, 
we get to the Katrina moment, right? Even if you didn't live here, it was a media event, international media event. You understand the significance. It was kind of um, really horrific with the entire city, most of the city underwater, lives lost, properties destroyed. I think a lot of us are still trying to rebuild a bit from Katrina. So um, I, I took a hit too, but I don't, uh, I didn't, uh, I was in it together, you know, there was a, a collectivity to it, so I didn't stew in any kind of pity. Um, so uh, the first experience I had, I went out, I was on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, I took the wrong turn. I was either going to go to Houston or to Pass Christian, a little on the other side of the track, and uh, bad choice, because ground the, the storm <laughs> kind of coming to New Orleans, and then it jagged to the east, right? Um, actually, I was closer to Long Beach area, but it was close to ground zero. And what I saw there, New Orleans was horrific, of course, with the flood and the loss of lives, but what I saw there, it was Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki. It was total splintered, everything, you didn't know where you were. In New Orleans, we had the flood, but the architecture still remained somewhat. You had a bit of grounding. But it was a, a, a real startling experience for me to see that. And I was standing, uh, I was doing a long walk, and I got to where a shopping center had been, and I was standing. Uh, 18 inches or so in shattered glass. And I'm crying and my parents' weekend house was gone and, you know, I was a bit choked. Uh, but all of a sudden the sun came out and I'm standing in a field of diamonds. It started glittering and it was just stupendous. And I said out loud <laughs> to myself, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Now that's another irony, right? A paradox. And nature gives us that in its destruction. It gives us renewal. It gives us beauty. And so, you know, we roll on. That is a footnote for a piece, a big piece that you will see in the show called Gulf and Galaxy. It's a nine foot by nine foot shattered glass toss piece. In the beginning, when I first did the work, it was more uh, literal, literally referencing kind of the hurricane patterns. And i have it's each time hand tossed, I, I, I say it's somewhat like doing a Tibetan sand painting, but I don't say I have that skill. But it's that kind of exercise. I think I've done the piece six times and it started getting more and more galactic because what we realize is the micro in nature mirrors the macro in nature. There are these similar patterns, right? So you'll see that when you um, go past the piece. And um, I also have given the work more of a bullseye strike to reference that um, asteroid that hit 66 million years ago, not far from us, you know, between us and the Yucatan. Across from that piece, there are uh, strung, what I call, the burnt chimes, I call them. Uh, but anyway, burnt timbers, and that is the remains of a 6,000 square foot studio. Again, you know, uh, I had not had much uh, self-pity with the Katrina experience, but when my studio burned down a few months after Katrina, because of politics, the mayor at the time bust a lot of people in and the neighborhood didn't have water to fight fires, it didn't have gas checks yet, it was off limits, you know. So I got, I said, well, I can handle the bang up from nature, but the folly of politics is a hard pill to swallow. Anyway, I got over it and there's, uh, I do hope you'll enjoy the piece of these suspended timbers as you know, in this uh, city, we had flood waters that reached different heights in different neighborhoods. And uh, standing in line to get gas or water or, you know, <laughs> MRI food, 
uh, you would hear people talking, and they would say, how much did you get? Well, we got three. Oh, we topped at eight. We, you know, we hit 12. No one even used the word water. We all knew we had this collective experience. And so there is an assembly of these water markers that I started doing, uh, referencing different water uh, levels in the, in the neighborhoods. And this was um, something unique for the New Orleans Museum of Art, where I've taken a lot of the height, heights and brought them all together on one wall to kind of create a high rise or a city of water. Um, so anyway, that's um, in that Katrina moment. Exiting that, there's a, a small drum uh, that I had found along with several uh, horn instruments that were damaged that I pulled out of the mud uh, from the streets of Katrina. I started collecting them and I did a piece in 2007 and again in 2008 called Dirge for Journey. And it was a 14 foot cypress skiff filled with the architectural salvage, you know, shutters, a window, a frame. But the instruments were the most gut-wrenching, right? Because the sound had been silenced in a way. Not in a way, it was. And uh, I went to the great, great, generous Terence Blanchard, uh, and he uh, agreed for me to work with him on this, and he allowed uh, the use of his extraordinary piece called Dirge on his album, I think it's called it's God, a Tale of God's Will. And if you haven't heard it, it's really, it still gets me. And so Terence's sound, particularly the horn, is uh, on the original piece was distributed inside the horns throughout the boat. And uh, there were many also in this drum. So we don't have the boat in the show, but the small drum filled with probably eight uh, horn instruments is there and uh, again Terrence thank you he's blessed us with that beautiful sound just behind that we're getting a little bit out of Katrina What's next? Oil spill. Yay! <laughs> right? So I have a, a big piece, and it's a seven-foot diameter projection of one drop, and it's set off the wall on a disc, and it seems to hover, sometimes benevolent, sometimes an angry planet. And it was inspired by, the, of course, the spill, but what's in the water, the use of the corrects and what's in the water in general, estrogen, nitrates, dead zones. So it's tricky to get people uh, motivated to speak up or to do something about the water back then. This is 2010 and 11, because it's invisible. It looks just fine, but uh, not so. So that piece is there, and on the waterfront, <laughs> We are the fastest eroding landmass in the world, and one of the two ground zero spots in Plaquemines Parish, and a place that has moved me for a good number of years, done a lot of uh, documentation around Lake Hermitage. And why there? It's because I'm a sucker for the beauty of the oak tree. Um, I know the Carolinas, have, everybody's got their oak trees, but we think of it kind of uh, almost as our logo for Louisiana in a way. Uh, anyway, there were just stunning oaks out there and with the oil dredging of canals and the saltwater intrusion, it, it's just startling to see hundreds of oak trees, huge oak trees that have been around for hundreds of years meeting a quick death for a, a convenience of industry. So that is one of the big, one of two big landscapes in the show. It's uh, printed on four by 10 foot metal panels. And it, it is kind of, a, I, for me, um, a sad, 
kind of scene of dead trees and moss, but you know, a lament, I would say it's a lament to our muse dying live. And then hidden, somewhat hidden behind a wall, you'll see a wrecking ball hanging from a medallion. It's part of a piece called Parlor Games, and uh, the, there are also behind this wall two columns in fall. It's, you know, ecology. It's also a colonial uh, breakdown, you know, breaking down our colonial past. It's uh, a moment to rethink how we want to rebuild. And part of that cluster is an aluminum mantle with um, aluminum objects, kind of kitschy souvenirs on top of it. And I started, this is kind of at the advance or part of the Mothership series where I said, well, we can't take originals with us. Uh, we're going to have to take small reproductions. And also, what's going to make it through the barriers of space? Our little wood objects might burn up. So I, st I said, OK, this mantle that is somewhere, you know that fabulous room in 2001 Space Odyssey, right? That gorgeous. I wanted to move in um, with the glowing floor. <laughs> I can see, uh, anyway, it's part of my own room, this this aluminum mantle and more, more metal and less soft fabric. When you walk past the mantle, you see this big ring, 30-foot ring, that we fit into the museum. The origins, what inspired me for that big ring. Thinking that we might have to leave, let me go to an interview I heard with Stephen Hawking, astrophysicist, who said, uh, maybe 15 years ago now, that we had 100 years left to figure out not how to save ourselves on Earth, but to figure out how we can really leave. That by 2045, the resources uh, to sustain human life are going to be so compromised. So, I, you know, I've been operating with that what if year, 2045. What if he's right? What if we have to have spaceships? And, um, but you know, it turns out, he, he vacillated, by the way. He, he came up with a few other dates. But there was, uh, anyone here know of the Rome Report? Uh, 1975 in Rome, there was a gathering of the great um, thinkers uh, in this field, scientists and humanists. And they gathered in Rome, and there was a, a paper or a small book you can get. Um, and it, to my surprise, I didn't know of this until maybe a year ago. But to my surprise, in 1976, they also came up with the year 2045 as the crunch year. Um, a graduate, uh, a doctorate, a uh, student, she was working on her dissertation. She went back to Rome, this is why I know of it, this past year, and she got together her, her own team of statisticians to analyze the data that was used to come up with 2045. And they ran the numbers again, and there was variations here and there, but the final sum was they too have resubstantiated this 2045. Now what I want to do is just hold that thought. Well, let me give you one more bit of optimism before we hold the thought. Leonardo da Vinci, you know, great artist and thinker, science, and you know, across the board. It was uh, released also in the last few years that in, within the painting, The Last Supper, that he had forecast what he thought to be the crunch time, and it's 4,006, so let's hope he's right. Um, but I kind of think he was talking about maybe the end of Earth itself, not human life, but Debbie Downer, Debbie Downer. Okay, so... The, the big ring, we're in the big ring. Why the ring? Well, the largest airships built to date 
are the, the big zeppelins, all right? And they all start with one ring. They hoist up this big, big ring. And then they connect se sequences of rings. So I've used it. I just, you know, adapted it, appropriated it, and made it my own symbol for, okay, well, here comes the spaceship, or there goes the spaceship. It's also my portal, just getting us to go into some kind of mindset where if we don't leave, how do we save what we have? That big ring here, the big ring, the earth, you know? So it's a portal for thought. And adjacent to this big ring is my second large landscape in the show. And it's a um, 36 foot piece. And it meets in a corner. And within this piece, I did it in 2012. And I use these rings kind of landing. There are ladders kind of trying to climb up to the rings. There's ladders also in some of the flooded landscapes because how do, how do we climb out of the rising tide? Um, and so the rings appear with the fiery landscape. And I tell you, it's um, when you look at the images, Australia, our west, look what's happening to the west. But this fiery landscape is there. So we've got the water and the fire. And these are real threats, you know. You can't say I'm really sensationalizing that. It's all around us and constant. So then we move a little post-human, maybe. And in this final chamber, there is a, a big piece called Tools Departing Definition. And it's what happens, we leave, what, what happens? What happens to all the stuff? Who will even know what it was? And I use tools. There are many objects I've done in a grouping from the Souvenirs of Earth series, but I use the tools here in this piece because anthropologists have said, many of them, that what defines us and separates us from other animal life, really, is we bury our dead and we use tools, we, we've made tools, we have technology, and, and you'll see an array of them, and it's layered, it's a mix of real tools kind of floating, and uh, imagery, 2D, two-dimensional imagery, and lighting, and lab, trying to do a bit of a lab overture. That shares the room with um, a piece called Dirt Bowl Table. It's uh, a 16-foot long, table with dozens and dozens of hand-carved wooden bowls, humble bowls, filled with earth uh, offerings from around the world. And this is an ongoing project, so please uh, do send me your, or your dirt if you haven't already. And going back to that picture I had described of me in Egypt, right, holding this bit of sand, you know, in the end, it's, it's very sacred, isn't it? It's, it's, it's so sacred. And um, it puts aside all of our differences because it, it, it is the common end. It, it is us. And even without uh, life, you know, running around on the planet, we are the planet. And um, that's a beautiful thing. The other large piece in the room is, let's see, I guess it's about a 10 foot high, 11 foot high old gate out of Europe. Kind of has a, a face embedded in the top and I've done a lot of work uh, with Milton's Paradise Lost, so of course I, I say it's Milton. And it's a piece that stands in for the last verse in Milton's Paradise Lost where um, it's the expulsion, you know, there we cross, we go through. But I can tell you that I had um, a, a bigger eureka than standing in the glass. And that eureka was while working with Milton on a public art project, which I'm not going to share with you tonight. But I had this awakening, subjective, but I'm going to go with it, that Genesis and Milton's Paradise Lost it's not a mythic tale of our origin. It is a prophecy of our future 
and I think it's now. And I think the paradise is the earth, and that's what we're getting ready to blow. So, hope not. Um, we'll see the show. It's going to be open an hour. I'll be around <laughs> if you have any questions. And I leave you uh, again with Emily Dickinson's I Shall Not Stop for Death. Um, none of us should. Art. Anyway, just breathe. Don't stop for death. Bye. I was an art student, of course, and a painter, and then I got more and more interested in what mass communications would do for shaping our future and the potential of communication systems as the glue, as, as maybe a media for new art. So I started doing some work in that area um, and really paid attention uh, to things happening through media. And I was shocked. We had just entered the 1991 Gulf War, the beginning of January, and I was shocked, going back to that word, that uh, they decided here in the U.S. to go ahead with the Super Bowl game, January 27th, 1991. I said, my God, we're, we're bombing people. I mean, this is very serious, and we're going to have this this game. And so I said, well, let me watch, because I, I like to watch the commercials. <laughs> well, because it, it, it shows you, doesn't it tell us something, like this is the most money being spent on this product, and we're trying to uh, influence you. OK, so, but I tuned in, and I was just shocked. I immediately said, oh, this is, anyway. I got all the film I had. I made a few calls. I was living in the French Quarter. I called any photographer I know. said, please, just bring over all your film. And I probably shot, you know, an image every two seconds. And <laughs> I caught on, <laughs> pre-digital, on real film, this kind of mix-up that the network had they went, you know, what a super is, is when they put a graphic up in front of an image on network news. So they had the Gulf War Super Bowl. It's <laughs> and Whitney Houston is singing, and I've got it in real <laughs> celluloid, you know. So that was amazing. And then um, the graphics at the time, which they are still used, like if you want to say, oh, well, the the quarterback got blitzed and they, the ends went here and they went there and there's a little chalk kind of scribble on the screen to show how, it got the, how he was sacked or how somebody outsmarted a, did a play. And then they'd cut to the war and they said, well, our troops went here and they were using the same kind of graphic pattern. I went, ooh, okay. Then the smart bomb was very popular, popularized in that war, right? So they would have a news break and show the latest bombing with the smart bomb hatch, the crosshairs. Then it cut to a pharmaceutical ad and all of a sudden the smart bomb hatch was killing the pain. Pain was being exploded like a bomb. Okay, then <laughs> um, there were news, news, news uh, break. Record oil profits, record oil profits, okay. And then the next thing was, ooh, the Persian Gulf oil spill. And here you have these gorgeous birds drenched in oil, dying live on television. It was uh, pretty tough to handle. And then cars, then the coaches, then General Schwarzkopf. Then the smart bomb hatch appears behind George Bush's. Okay, we get to halftime show, and then it's Disneyland Castle, and lots of kids running around with the American flag. I said, is this Lenny Riefenstahl? Is this Triumph of the Will? Or what? You know, it, it was so heavy propaganda, I thought. And so then we'd cut from this tinsel kind of creation 
of the Disneyland castle on the, on the football field, and they went to another bombing, and they were afraid the ziggurat was going to get bombed, and there was this other archaeological museum. So it became also a battlefield between the youngest nation and the oldest nation. And it goes on and on and on. Um, we just have a small a few slides here, but I'm glad it's uh, referenced in the show. Thank you. It's the newest work in the show, and it's a 70-foot curved wall, a gorgeous hidden treasure here in the museum that they have availed. Katie, thank you so much for making that room possible. It's four projections of one unified landscape, and what it is, let's start with what it really is, and that is there's a statue. There's a 28-inch marble statue that I found that had been very, very damaged. Uh, I thought had been under the sea for a good while. I thought the sand, the, the, the bottom of the sea had carved into the marble. Uh, there was a bit of green algae on it now, kind of cleaned off. It could be, it was some other uh, reason for her distress. There are arms, but broken. It seemed to me that it was maybe, if not a Mother Mary, some type of goddess from the past with child. But the child is gone, and I said, oh, God, childless mother. So in the souvenirs of Earth trajectory, I said, well, what if this is the last thing to survive on the whole planet? The other asteroid hits us. Everything's gone. It's a big ball of fire. But somehow, this damaged statue um, of a mother made its way out into outer space. But there's no one, as a, similar to tools departing definition, there's no one to know what it is. She's a piece of stone. She's out there floating with meteors and asteroids and a few dead planets. Um, so it starts uh, with a gesture of fire and some explosion, um, catapults the statue into space. She floats around, and then at the very end, being a tad of a classicist, I could <laughs> the, the statue kind of makes uh, rotations and then goes out into uh, dark space. So anyway, it was at Rika's maybe. You know, though, I go, because I like working with uh, architectural salvage, so I'm always sightseeing. And there was this, they had uh, plaster statues everywhere, and, you know, there was the real Joseph, the real Mary, the Christ, and uh, you know the story of St. Expedite, anybody? I'm not going to tell you now, but next talk. All right, so there are these statues around, none of them too spectacular, uh, but maybe a hundred of these plaster saints and plaster Marys. And there was this that can't stand up on its own and it was lying on a low table. And it, I just got, whoa, you know, just it moved me immediately. And so the owners, they very charge way too much, I think. And so I held my breath and said, I, I said, is this for sale? Yes. And I, and I said, well, what do you want for it? And I tell you, I had such immediate love. I don't know where I would have gotten thousands of dollars, but I wanted it that badly. Okay, so I held my breath and I said, how much? Well, what do you want to offer? And I said, I said well, I've been being kind of a cheapy here. And so I said, well, let's start low. So I said, $40. 40 dollars I offered and she said oh yeah take it I want it out of here it's given me the creeps <laughs> so now she's the star uh, <laughs> of this piece and uh, you know it's been going on over three and a half years like is this really the piece you want to feature for the end of time the post-human experience and I stand by it damn yes yes so Thank <laughs> you.